Mark chapter 13, I'm going to begin reading in verse 24. And this is the New Revised Standard Version. But in those days, Jesus says, after that suffering, this is the suffering he's been describing in the previous sermons of our series, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep watch, for you don't know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The scriptures insist that all of our stories begin in the same place and that the ultimate story of humanity will end at the same place. And then all the other stories show us the variations of the experiences people have in their lives. All of you were born in the Garden of Eden. Now, Adam and Eve were really there in a physical garden, I believe, here on earth. I don't know all the story because the Bible only tells me a little snippet but I know that what the Bible tells me is true and that this is the right way to remember it. But it wasn't just them who were born in the Garden of Eden. You too were born in the Garden of Eden. You were in your mother's womb and it was safe. You didn't have to work for food. The food came to you. Now there are serpents in the Garden of Eden and for some there were serpents even when they were in the womb. Some parents did drugs. Some parents aborted these children while they were still in the garden. But all of us were born in a safe place where we did not have to work for food, where everything was easy. That was in the body of our mothers. And then some of us, thankfully, got to stay in Eden even after we were born because we were born into a loving home with loving parents. And the financial resources were okay. And we didn't have to worry about where our next meal was going to come from. And we had clothes to wear. And we didn't worry about who made the meat that's on my plate or where they got it. It just showed up and I ate it. All of us were born. All of us. In Eden. And at some point we awoke. And we began to be tempted to do things that we knew were wrong. That somehow we knew that the thing we wanted to eat the most was a fruit we should not pluck. And that moment you joined Adam and Eve at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you decided to eat it. And from that day forward, Eden changed. Your access to it was altered, and you became a child of the world. All of you know that story. All of our stories begin the same. Every life begins in Eden. Every life is exiled. And every life now has to make its way in a world in which we have broken the most sacred of trusts. And every life has an end. The beginnings are all the same, but the ends vary. It very much depends on what happens next that leads to certain kinds of endings. But what the scriptures are clear about when we think about it nationally is that the flood story tells us that nations and civilizations, in the, in the case of the flood, the entire global population of humanity on earth can get to a point in which the sin is so intractable, in which the wickedness is so pernicious, in which the people are so blind to their own complicity in the wickedness of the earth that repentance becomes impossible and judgment is all that is left. And that's the story of the flood. And it has been the story of the fall of nations ever since. In fact, God promised 
that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. How could he guarantee that humanity together wouldn't become this evil again? Well, he, he tells us immediately. He divided the people at, at Babel so they couldn't work together. He split up their languages. He divided their ethnicities. And now they wouldn't work together anymore. So now he can bring judgment on one nation at a time and not all at once because they would no longer trust each other or be able to communicate. But ever since that day, the enemy has been at work as well, trying to reunify humanity into one people. Perhaps because he wants to see God destroy us all. But what we see over and over again in history is that right before God's judgment comes, the people of the earth sow to their flesh, rebel entirely against the knowledge of God, erode people's belief in that knowledge, embrace things that God has called evil, and celebrate those who do the same. That happens right before the end of every single nation that has lived on the earth through history. So where are we on the timeline of history? The life of Jesus himself becomes way more than a story of how you and I get saved. It is a story of that. But it's also the story of how things look at the end and what life the faithful must choose to live when things are ending. In Jesus' day, it was Judaism that was ending. Right before the, the covenant with Moses was fractured beyond repair. And his life tells us what it looks like when things are nearing their end and what Christians can expect and how we must live. And I think that's where we are. I really believe, church, that we are in the days of Jeremiah. I think we are nearing a time in which judgment is inevitable, and I don't expect, no matter what we do, that God will turn away from it. Three times in the book of Jeremiah, every false prophet in the book of Jeremiah told the people that if they just got their lives straight, God would not do what the scriptures say he will do when people do what they were doing. But three times in Jeremiah, God says these words to him. As for you, he said, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, do not pray for this people. Do not raise a cry or prayer on their behalf and do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they're doing in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? As I was reading those passages over this fall, I felt the Lord saying the same thing. It seems to me that when nations commit themselves to these kinds of behaviors, the judgment of God comes. Not quickly, because God is patient and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And cultures usually have centuries to get this straight before God's judgment comes. But I feel now we are nearing the end of his tolerance. Jeremiah chapter 11, God repeats the same thing to Jeremiah a few chapters later. He says this, as for you, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in their time of trouble. What right has my beloved in my house when she's done vile deeds? And chapter 14, the same. The Lord said to me, Jeremiah speaking, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Although they fast, I do not hear their cry. And although they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I do not accept them. But by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, I, can, I consume them. God does not do this to the people of Israel in Jeremiah's day because he's a mean God or because he's angry, but because they have abused each other for centuries because they have taken advantage of each other for centuries, because they have lived with unforgiveness in their hearts and bitterness and rage. They've lived selfishly and they've taken from those that could not afford to lose it. And they have given only to those who didn't need it because they've done this for centuries. God finally says, I cannot tolerate any more the evil of humanity being done under the sun. And he weeps and he mourns for those who have been oppressed and for those who have been denied justice, and those who have been taken advantage of and abused. I think we're in the days of Jeremiah in our culture. I think God's judgment is certain, and I don't expect that to change. But what should we do? I have been calling us to repent, but not because I think we can forestall God's judgment, but because I know from Scripture that when judgment comes, God will be with his people who have not forsaken him. And so I'm calling us to repentance too, 
to recognize our season and to recognize if we've been holding on to sin, it is time to let it go. If we have drank the Kool-Aid of our culture and we've bought the idea that there really is no God in the heavens, that nobody is watching, that all that's, that matters are the laws we write and the way we choose to enforce it, and we make what's right and what's wrong, and there's nobody else that has any say over it. For those who have bought that, this is the time to release it. Because I think that spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the idea that there is no God watching, that Jesus is not Lord, that his teachings are not authoritative for the people of the earth, I think that is what's going to come under judgment. And I would beg you, I would plead with you as the people of God not to be participating with the idols he's about to tear down. And that's why I've been preaching the way that I have. And that led me to the book of Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah is a prophet who testifies to the destruction of Israel and then also prophesies the destruction of all things at the end when the Messiah finally comes. And, and it seems to me that of all the prophets, Zechariah splits this hair wonderfully well. Zechariah seems to recognize that when God's judgment is absolute and there is no way to turn it away, there is still hope for the people of God. There is still something for the people of God to do so that when God's avenging angel comes, his people will be found awake and they will be spared as the, as the children of Israel were in the Passover when they put the blood of the lamb over the door frames of their houses and the avenging angel went through Egypt and those without the blood were sacrificed, but those with the blood on their door frames, their houses were passed over and they were spared. I think Zechariah recognizes that at the end of all things, that distinction between the world and the faithful must be sharply drawn and the faithful must have the blood on their door frames. Zechariah realizes it's not the blood of a lamb that's going to save us in those seasons. It's going to be the blood only of Christ. So the question is, what does Christ want done among the people of God when judgment is coming? How does he want us to respond? What do the people of God do when the walls are falling? Zechariah tells us. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and lamented in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink only for yourselves? Were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, when Europe was rooted in the foundation of Judeo-Christian ethics and all of the fruit hung low and you were inventing things and you were discovering things and new technologies seemed to be coming every day? Aren't these the words I said then? When Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity along with the towns around it, when the Negev and the Shephelah were inhabited, these are all regions in the nation of Israel, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments. This is what God said while they were in prosperity. Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, or the poor. And do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. But they refused to listen and turned a stubborn shoulder and stop their ears in order not to hear. During the times of prosperity, we refused to be godly. And so now the option of being godly is being taken away. And I think that's exactly where we, were, where we are now in the West. And I believe that that's exactly where Israel was when Zechariah wrote. But then the question, and this is the deeper one, well, what then for the people of God? What for those who really want to follow God, who want to be God's people when the walls are falling, when the waters are rising, when chaos ensues, when the parties of a culture like ours are tearing each other apart? Where should the Christians stand? And what kind of things should we be doing in that space? What does God want of us? Well, Zechariah has a hopeful word for those who want God and not simply safety on earth. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I purpose to bring disaster upon you when your ancestors provoked me to wrath and I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts. You can hear all the stories echoing from the flood to the destruction of Israel, to the destruction of Judah, all the way through the destruction of Rome, the destruction of the Nazis and the French, whatever. Just as all that happened to your ancestors. So again, I have purposed in these days now to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. 
This is not spoken to all who call themselves Christians. It's spoken to those who know Jesus is Lord. Do not be afraid. This is for the people who really, really, really believe Jesus is their rightful king. That Jesus has the right to tell them what to do. That Jesus knows the way of righteousness and he has instructed us in it. And in his word are recorded the words of life. That no one comes to the Father except through him. That no one can become his disciple unless they deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. Those who really believe that, do not be afraid. God has given you something to do when the walls are falling apart. And it's not confusing, and it's not hard to understand. It may be hard to do, but it is not hard to understand, and here it is. These are the things you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates. The gates are the entrance to your cities. So for you, those of you who have homes, in your houses. For those of you who are part of communities like this, in the decision-making parts of communities of faith. Wherever decisions are made, render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil. That's a word in the Old Testament for harm, hurt in your hearts against one another. Do not wish for the fall of your enemies. Do not wish for the suffering of your adversaries. Do not long for the punishment of those who have punished you. Don't do that when the walls fall. That's what the world will do. But you are to be a different people when the world is falling under judgment. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath. Honor no promise to be unfaithful to God. For all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. This is how we stay awake when the walls fall. If judgment comes, and I believe it is coming, the people of God forgive those who hurt us. The people of God hold no grudges against those who have cheated us. The people of God accept ridicule, and we do not ridicule in response to ridicule. We do not spread gossip about people behind their backs and try and erode people's sense of confidence in them because we don't care for them. This is not what the people of God do. For all these things, judgment comes on the people of the earth. The people of God forgive. The people of God make peace. The people of God release vengeance and let God have it. The people of God share out of their resources with those who are hurting. The people of God see the one who is isolated and alone and they welcome them into their homes. May it be God's will that the moment Jesus comes back, that's what he finds us doing. This is what we do when the world falls apart. The people of God trust Jesus. We have a different agenda than the people of the earth. The people of the earth want to survive. We believe in resurrection of the dead. The people of the earth want their children to be prosperous and safe. We believe our children are safest in the arms of Jesus. The people of the earth want to be free from disease. And they want artificial intelligence to care for their every need. And they want inoculations and vaccinations to give them peace against nature. And they want to develop technologies that will allow them to live in sin without having to deal with the consequences of those sins. But the people of Jesus need none of these things. The people of Jesus want to be a holy people, a people who can be trusted by our neighbors, a people who, when the world falls apart, our neighbors say, you know what? We need to go to those people. Those people will not betray us. Those people will not smear us. Those people, we can trust them. I don't know if we can trust any of our other neighbors, but I know if we go to that house, we're going to find help. Those are the people we want to be. But we have to be those people when we're in prosperity, if God's going to trust us to be those people when judgment comes. Are you awake? This is how we stay awake. God would like you to bring proper judgment, to hold your tongue and not curse your fellow humans and not gossip about those you don't like and not tear down those that you think have been unfairly propped up. This is the people of God. These are the fasts God requires. And if you are his people and you will embrace love and forgiveness, grace and mercy, holiness in your own life, justice in your own home, 
than when the walls fall and the locusts come in to eat the crops and the world loses its head, we will be gathered together just as we are today in worship and going out and helping every person that we see that the world has left behind. And we will gather up all the rubble of the destruction of God and we will build for people homes and we will build for people lives and we will forgive and we will care and we will be holy. Whoever rules, we're going to be the best possible citizens we can be because the scriptures tell us that we need to submit to the governing authorities as unto God. That's in Romans chapter 13. We're going to be the best possible citizens no matter who our rulers are. We're going to obey laws because it is right to obey them unless those laws cause us to reject Jesus or to disobey God. Other than that, we'll obey all the laws. We're going to be the best imaginable citizens, no matter who the government is, because we are the people of God. We don't need to be respected. We don't need to be defended. We don't need to be protected. We just need to be holy. The walls that have held us captive. Walls of safety and security, of fear and of doubt must fall because when God's judgment comes, those hidden behind those walls will find no quarter and no safety. Only those who have left those places of safety and walked out into the vulnerable space of being the people of God, living open lives, living with forgiveness, refusing to compromise in sin, only they will be welcoming when Jesus comes. Everybody else will be hiding, asking, as the scriptures say, for the hills to fall on them, to hide their sins from the God who's coming. Let's be holy. And here's our verse again. These are the things you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Do not lie to each other. Render in your gates, wherever decisions are made in your life, Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Do not devise harm to come on your enemies. And love no false oath. Be loyal to no promise that separates you from God. For all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. This is what you are to do. You can begin right now. You know what you're to do when judgment comes. You are to be the people of God no matter the season. 